A Turning Point After bidding farewell to Octavia, Antony had let his unruly heart lead him back once more to his beloved Cleopatra. He had sent to Egypt for her, and she had come to meet him again in Asia Minor. At the first touch of her hands and lips, the four years that had separated them seemed to melt away. Their plans for the future came to life again, plans for ruling the entire world. And in no foolish Roman way, said Cleopatra, but like gods on earth, absolute and supreme, as kings were born to be. First, I must conquer Parthia, said Antony, who, after all, preferred conquering to ruling. At this suggestion, Cleopatra furnished gold and supplies and went with them as far as the Euphrates River, there to see him off on that long-talked-of campaign. In return, he presented her with a number of the richest Roman provinces in Asia Minor, a generous gift indeed, had they been his to give. Cleopatra also received a coveted strip of Herod's property along the Jordan River near Jericho, valuable for its palms and balsam. That threw Herod into such a murderous rage that he was tempted to have Cleopatra waylaid and killed as her gorgeous retinue came trailing back through Palestine. But not daring to do so, he had had her conducted safely home along the ancient highway to the border of Egypt. There she waited for good news from Parthia. None came. The campaign had turned into a hideous disaster, from which Anthony had come staggering back in remorse and sunk into a drunken stupor. Cleopatra had rescued him. The easy pleasures of Alexandria soon revived his spirits, and the next year he set out a second time to conquer those unconquerable Parthians. That time, although he still failed to reach Parthia, Antony got as far as Armenia. He marched on the capital, put the king in chains, and sent him back to Alexandria, where his victory was celebrated by a most magnificent triumph. When the Romans heard of that, they were dumbfounded. A Roman triumph in Alexandria, they exclaimed. Why on earth should Antony hold a triumph in Egypt instead of here in Rome? To that question, Octavian had a ready answer. Antony intends to make Alexandria, instead of Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire, he told the Senate. Antony is bewitched by Cleopatra. Has he not bestowed upon her provinces which belong to you as Romans? Has he not deserted Octavia, his faithful wife, for that accursed female? You should leave his house, Octavian then told his sister. But Octavia, only wishing not to be the cause of trouble, would not leave until Antony, offended by her brother's slander of Cleopatra, sent a bill of divorce to her and requested her to move. By this harsh act, Antony lost much sympathy in Rome. He still had, however, many staunch defenders in the Senate, who now attacked Octavian. They accused him of cheating Antony's soldiers out of their fair share of land, and cited other grave mismanagements to which Octavian made a quick reply. Any and all senators, he announced, who wish to support Antony are now requested to leave Rome at once. Four hundred, almost half the Senate, packed up and left Italy. All were firmly determined to persuade Antony to break from Cleopatra. It was the only way they agreed that he could save himself from ruin. They found Antony in Athens, but with no desire to be saved. Newly wed to Cleopatra, he was spending his honeymoon carefree and deliriously happy. Octavian, back in Rome, however, was a very worried man. What if, 
for once he had acted too hastily. What if the Senate could not be made to declare Antony a public enemy? He was almost ill with nervousness until he heard about the will, the will which Antony had made out just before leaving Italy. In the safekeeping of the Vestal Virgins, it was a sacrilege to touch it, but Octavian was desperate. He had it seized, and when to his relief he found the evidence it contained, he had it read aloud before the Senate. In the will, Anthony named his children by Cleopatra as his only heirs, and declared that Caesarion, Cleopatra's son, was the only rightful heir of his father, Julius Caesar. Could more proof be needed, Octavian asked, of Anthony's treacherous intentions? Yet he did not follow up the reading of the will by requesting the Senate to declare war on Antony. He was too shrewd for that. Very cleverly, he threw all the blame on the Queen of Egypt, and pictured her as such an artful, dangerous enemy of Rome that the Roman Senate felt obliged to declare war on Cleopatra. Octavian was satisfied. That means Antony, too, he thought. He'll never break away from her. And in that, he was right. Antony could not bring himself to part with Cleopatra, though he grew quarrelsome and edgy over the bad omens that now began to occur. First, the statue of Bacchus, the god he represented, was knocked over in a cyclone. That was in Athens. In the town of Patras, the temple of his divine ancestor Hercules, was struck by lightning. And there, too, the swallows that lived in the rigging of Cleopatra's flagship were driven away by a strange flock of birds. Patras, where they had then moved, was a port on the west coast of Greece. The Egyptian fleet and Antony's two hundred battleships were at anchor in the gulf. There they stayed until word came that Octavian had landed with an army on the point of a small bay farther to the north. Antony then moved north to that same bay and went into camp on the opposite point, which was called Actium. Antony stationed his soldiers around the shore of the bay in such a way that Octavian's men could not move inland without a battle. On the other hand, once inside the bay, the fleets of Antony and Cleopatra could not move out because Octavian's ships were lined up across the mouth. There were four hundred of them, most of them light, swift ships which Agrippa had built for use against the pirates. Don't risk a battle against these ships, Antony was advised by the Roman generals. Draw Octavian inland to a land battle. We are not sailors, begged the centurions. Let us fight on land, where we know how to fight, not on rotten timbers. Cleopatra, on the contrary, kept begging Anthony to make it a naval battle, urging him and pleading with him in a tone of voice that he could not resist. On September 1st, he announced to his men that the next day they would engage in a battle at sea. Then, having decided to make it a naval battle, Having set the day and forced the Roman soldiers to fight on water instead of land, Antony did not even wait to see how the battle turned out. It seems unbelievable, but it is true. At first, when the ships were rowed out of the harbor, Cleopatra had been watching them from her flagship anchored near the shore. Antony saw her there as the battleships, loaded with foot soldiers and archers, left the narrows for the open sea. She was still there as Octavian's light ships moved in swiftly about Antony's huge ones and began to attack them as they would a fortress. But then suddenly, while the battle was still undecided, Antony noticed that Cleopatra's ship was moving. It was sailing away. Forgetful of the battle, forgetful of those thousands of men who were fighting and dying for him, forgetful of everything except that Cleopatra was leaving him, 
Anthony, ruled as always by his emotions, and now completely swept away, turned and sailed after her. Two hours later, the fleet surrendered, and the Battle of Actium was over. One of the most important battles in the history of the world was this battle at Actium, for it was more than a contest between two ambitious men. It was a struggle between two ways of living. The age-old despotism of the East, where rulers had power of life and death over the degraded subjects, and the new Western ideals of justice according to law and order, which the Roman Republic had developed. It was a turning point in history. The decision had been made. The world was going forward.